Okay, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. My, my name is Tafar Rabalai. I'm a forester by profession, currently working as development officer for uh, MBAR. Welcome for this uh, very important event, the 25th anniversary of MBAR, as well as the second uh, World Bamboo Congress. Of course, also welcome to this very important session, resource assessment, bamboo resource assessment and ecosystem service. This session is organized together with uh, uh, Food and Agricultural Organization of the United Nations and IMBAR. So uh, uh, this session is indeed selected as one uh, in this uh, event because, uh, you know, bamboo is very important resource. This very important resource to be uh, wisely used, it is indeed very important to have uh, a proper resource assessment, inventory, and the like. Uh, as you know, over the years, the techniques, methods, and the technology of resource assessment has improved a lot. You know, uh, imagine some years back, uh, collection of resources, uh, is there any? Okay. So uh, with the development of the technologies and the techniques, this, uh, this, the quality and precision of uh, uh, the result is also tremendously improved. And uh, uh, to that, uh, as a result of that, it is, it is indeed necessary to arrange this session because in this session, it is, it is uh, planned that uh, very distinguished panelists will share their experience. And <clears throat> those, those uh, 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 the experts come from the north, from the south, from the east or the west. So uh, there is a good representation of speakers. Uh, so without saying too much on the arts, I think it is, it is uh, indeed good to go uh, directly to the uh, specialists or to the subject matter experts. First uh, uh, will be uh, Mr. Marco. Mr. Marco is an expert in forestry. He has a lot of experience in uh, forest resource assessment, monitoring, and evaluation. He has also done similar tasks on bamboo uh, resources. So uh, Mr. Marco will give us uh, a speech on the general development of bamboo resource assessment, especially will give us a general direction, keynote, and review of uh, those issues. Mr. Marco, Please take the floor. The floor is yours for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Tefera. Let me share my screen. One second.
Okay, sorry for the delay. Do you confirm that you see my screen correctly? We have seen your screen. I hope it yeah. is the correct, correct one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, now it's in full screen, in full. Um... Okay, uh, sorry for the delay. Anyway, thank you, Mr. Tefera, for your words. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is uh, Marco Piazza. I'm a forestry officer with FAO at the regional office of Asia Pacific in uh, Bangkok. So my main working area is forest monitoring, uh, but I have a lifelong interest and passion for bamboo and I have collaborated with Imbar in, uh, in the past. So I am particularly pleased to be here today for this session. So in this first presentation, I just like to provide a few introductory remarks on the scope uh, of the session and on the overall goal of learning more about the current status and opportunities for, for, um, for the assessment of bamboo um, resources and uh, related ecosystem services. So the, as was mentioned, this session is organized as a collaboration between IMBAR and FAO in the person of myself and uh, uh, Mr. Tefera. Um, however, IMBAR and FAO have a, a much longer history of uh, collaboration. Um, starting from the most recent past, uh, I can mention a memorandum of understanding that was signed between IMBAR and FAO with the specific goal of strengthening bamboo and rattan's contribution to sustainable development. This was back in November 2020. You can see a screenshot of the signing ceremony, which was virtual. We were still in uh, COVID times at, um, in that period. And the collaboration covers a variety of thematic areas, and there is also a, uh, a task force dedicated specifically to bamboo resource assessment. Um, however, even before this memorandum of understanding, FAO and IMBAR have collaborated on a, on a variety of projects and activities and studies, and I can mention a few recent ones. One is a Bamboo for Land Restoration, which was a policy report uh, this was presented at the, the previous uh, Global Bamboo and Rattan Congress, uh, BARC, in 2018. Um, another one, for, uh, as an example, under the UN Red Umbrella, um, there was a development of a guiding principles for sustainable bamboo forest management planning in Ethiopia. Um, and so these are just two examples of, uh, again, past collaboration between FAO and IMBAR. There is also some uh, field activity uh, that saw the, the involvement of both organizations. <clears throat> um, however, in this context, the most important collaboration that I'd like to mention um, is a publication called the War Bamboo Resources. Uh, it's a thematic study prepared in the framework of the Global uh, Forest Resource Assessment of 2005. So we're talking about uh, more than 15 years ago. Um, so this study was uh, triggered by the realization of the lack of uh, reliable, comprehensive, comprehensive data on bamboo resources. So I was uh, honored to be part of this study and uh, co-author of this publication together with uh, Sean Paudel, who is also with us today. And uh, so we were able to collect some good information from the country at national level, uh, particularly from the Asia region. But we arrived at uh, one conclusion, uh, which is that bamboo statistics are often poor, inconsistent, fragmented, and based on different definitions and methodologies in different countries. So I, uh, I follow this publication quite closely, and I see that many, every year there are uh, many citations from other studies that still refer to this publication uh, as the most reliable source of uh, information on bamboo assessment. And this is, of course, quite good. Uh, but again, this is uh, already more than 15 years ago, so even this publication is becoming quite uh, outdated. Uh, nevertheless, this is, a, this is a, a clear sign that there is a growing demand for uh, data and information on bamboo resources. Um, so in my, in my daily job, I, I work on national forest monitoring and national forest inventory, and our mission statement has always been that better data lead to better decisions right? Um, only with uh, reliable data, we can make informed decision, we can influence policy, uh, policy making, and ultimately have an impact on, uh, on the ground. So at the same, uh, we feel that the same applies to bamboo. And uh, but more and more, we see that, that despite the recognized range of benefits and potential of bamboo, in, uh, we know that in many countries, bamboo has not been managed, sustainable, or used effectively, at least as much as it could. 
Um, we also see that both at global and national level, there is a growing demand for updated information on bamboo resources. As an example, uh, FAO, uh, FAO's FRA, the uh, Forest Resource Assessment of 2020, only 23 countries reported information on bamboo resources. Um, there is an estimated area of 35 million hectares and uh, 1,600, more than 1,600 species recorded. But we know, uh, we feel that this is a largely an underestimation of the total bamboo area. So if we look at the, some of the current efforts on bamboo resources assessment, uh, first of all, we should recognize the increased availability of high resolution imagery and uh, advanced methods and tools that we can, we can use. Uh, we also recognize that the scientific community regularly produces studies on bamboo, including on bamboo assessments methodologies via remote sensing. And uh, we will see examples of both of these points in the next presentations. Um, we also see that bamboo data is reported to FRA. So it does appear in the forest resource assessment uh, document, which is published every five years. Not as much as we would like, as I mentioned before, but also here, this is an indication of some of the challenges of reporting on bamboo. Uh, we see that sometimes bamboo is included under forest uh, if it meets the uh, FAO definition of, uh, of forest. Uh, sometimes it's included uh, as uh, bamboo being a subclass of forest. Uh, other times it's, re it's reported as other land with tree cover, sometimes as non-timber forest products. So you see that this creates um, a challenge, it creates a, a it's difficult to have a clear estimate if there is not a uniform and uh, um, homogeneous definition. Uh, as I mentioned, I do work in national forest inventory. So bamboo is uh, typically a species that it is collected and recorded. So we regularly record on uh, species of bamboo, other biophysical uh, characteristics such as cone per clump, uh, average DH and so on, height. So anyway, then we see the bamboo does appear in our monitoring and inventory efforts. Um, I also would like to recognize here um, a publication from, uh, from INBAR, which is a manual for, uh, for bamboo forest biomass and carbon assessment, which is probably the most complete up-to-date, complete manual for the assessment of bamboo in the field. Perhaps the most comprehensive effort on establishing a, a global assessment for bamboo um, and rattan is IMBAR's Global Assessment of Bamboo and Rattan for Green Development Initiative. It goes by the acronym of GABAR. This again was triggered by the um, lack of a reliable information on bamboo, as was mentioned before. Uh, GABAR has a few um, stated goals. Uh, it aims to provide better information about bamboo and rattan resources, of course, uh, aims at showing how bamboo and rattan can contribute to climate change mitigation, adaptation, biodiversity conservation, renewable energy, sustainable economic development, and the list can go on. As uh, we know, um, we all know bamboo and we know that uh, the, uh, the utilization and the potential of bamboo is uh, almost endless. And we will see some of that also in the, in the <clears throat> in the next presentations. So another goal of GABAR is to establish a, a knowledge sharing network uh, to build on lessons learned and experiences gathered in the field, and also to define opportunities to make it clear, a, a clear environment for opportunities uh, for donors and uh, private investors to take part in the bamboo se sector and uh, uh, capitalize on, on its characteristics. Um, more specifically, again, on, uh, on GABAR products, products and services, um, GABAR offers methodologies for bamboo assessments, um, offers a bamboo database with availability, management, practices, uses, and technologies, uh, national profiles of bamboo contribution to climate change, livelihood, and economy. Uh, it contains policy briefs and strategies and a toolkit with documents and tools and reports and study cases um, and experience that were gathered. Uh, already a few countries have picked up on, uh, on this initiative. 
um, in Asia, in Africa, and uh, in Latin America. And these are examples of uh, countries who are used uh, the available information to define their own national strategies on bamboo. So this is the importance of uh, this, uh, <clears throat> this platform that IMBAR has created. Uh, however, there is a, a key challenge. The key challenge is uh, um, the challenges in terms of uh, resources available, basically, to make uh, to make the system more impactful and more sustainable. At time, it requires further contribution from uh, from the government and from uh, possibly from donor to make it uh, last longer and to expand. Um, so we. Um, we are convinced. Um, so again, so why we are uh, advocating a, a more work on bamboo resource assessment? We are, we are convinced that the harmonized global approach, uh, as well as improved capacity at national level, is required to establish bamboo monitoring systems. Um, and uh, we think that this monitoring system should be uh, designed in a way that are uh, accessible, meaning that they are available to those who make use of it, including policymakers, practitioners in the field, um, academic and the scientific institution, and they would all benefit from improved information and data on bamboo, um, on bamboo resources. Um, a system for the monitoring of bamboo resources should also be relevant, should be uh, targeted to what uh, our goals are, uh, they should be able to answer the questions that, again, come from uh, people who use the data, the policymakers or donors. Um, uh, they should also be sustainable in a sense that there should be um, enough budget allocated with the trained staff uh, in a way that bamboo assessments becomes institutionalized and becomes a permanent uh, um, effort inside of a, the larger national uh, forest monitoring systems. So these are what are, uh, these are a, a little bit my hope, or I can be, uh, speak on behalf of this panel or what we think in terms of uh, further work for uh, uh, bamboo resource assessment. I will stop um, here. Again, thank you for your, um, for your attention. Thank you, Tefera, and uh, back to you for uh, the rest of the presentations. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Mr. Marco for your uh, eloquent, very clear overview of the, uh, the activities done over the years, especially the knowledge development aspect, the field monitoring and related issues in relation to the work of uh, FAO and of course, in collaboration with uh, IMBAR, a lot of them has been done. And uh, uh, thank you for that. Uh, uh, this is uh, very uh, good. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to move to the uh, next uh, panelist. The next uh, uh, panelist is Mr. Uh, Rami. Uh, uh, sorry if I wrongly pronounce your name, Mr. Rami Denunsho. Uh, he is he is uh, uh, also uh, a known expert in the uh, forest and bamboo uh, resource areas. The, he is uh, a forestry officer coordinating specifically the Red Plus investment activities, national forest monitoring work, especially in East Africa. He is also working uh, or supporting the FAO technical capacity stream and he is uh, working on open source data solutions these days. So as part of this uh, extensive activity, he will briefly present us uh, one of those uh, uh, data system that is a uh, CEPAL, and he will show us how this is applied and how the system is working, especially in developing country. The floor is yours, Mr. Remy. Please uh, stick to 10 minutes. Thank you.
Thank you very much, uh, Tefera. Uh, hello, hello, everybody. Uh, I would just uh, require the person who is sharing screen to stop sharing because I will share my own and I think it's the wrong one. Thank you very much. Can you confirm you can see my screen in presentation mode? Yes, we yes. can. Thank you very much. Good morning again, everybody. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I don't know exactly where everybody is in the attendance, but uh, I'm very happy that uh, we could get a slot to present to you the, the separate platform today as uh, one potential free and open source solution for land cover classification. Maybe not all solutions, but uh, at least one that could uh, potentially help to to better produce data for for bamboo. Um, so my name is Remy Danuncio. I work as a as a forestry officer in the Food and Agriculture Organization. I'm based in the headquarters in Rome, and I will try to to give you a brief overview of uh, how CEPAL stands. So um, you may have not heard about it, but CEPAL is an online data processing platform developed within the Open Forest Initiative. It's a uh, it's a working environment. It's not a it's not a web portal or a, or a, um, a GIS software. It's it's a working environment that builds on cloud computing infrastructure that allows users to access supercomputers to analyze big data. And the main mission of uh, of the platform is to break barriers. It's to um, allow users to not be limited by their hardware and to access geospatial data and tools to create data that fit their needs. Um, basically, you don't need to be a, a very strong computer scientist or to develop software to access these tools. You just need a, a decent connection to the internet and um, and then you can access a lot of uh, power computers. Here on the examples that is shown on screen, you can see how one person can generate a seamless, ready to analyze satellite image mosaic uh, at a national level, in the case of Bangladesh, uh, using um, using um, different uh, optical imagery. The sources that can be used within within CEPAL are all the uh, all the public uh, uh, information that is uh, that is out there. Basically, we have 49 year uh, archive of US Landsat observation and we also have um, that is that has recently been continued with with Landsat 9. So we have a very long sustainable um, provision of images. Uh, that is also being complemented now with the European Space Agency's Copernicus program uh, with the Sentinel-1 radar and Sentinel-2 optical data. Um, within CEPAL, we bring together those data in a robust working environment that is maintained with the most common programming languages, uh, such as R, such as Python, mm -hmm. GR, and that is building on the power of Google Earth Engine and other cloud-based computing solutions. We are partnering with a lot of uh, with a lot of um, technical and um, and research uh, institutions to build up the platform itself. So I will I will now dive a little bit inside the platform and uh, to explain to you um, what is inside. The what we do within CEPAL is to is to bridge science and practice and to make available uh, data and tools. Um, CEPAL is constantly evolving. Uh, it's, it's a very dynamic uh, working environment that is based on feedback from users and countries. And it's also a place where scientists can distribute their research. Um, here you have an example of how one algorithm for change detection has been embedded in an easy to use graphical user interface to perform change detection. And um, the data that is being mapped is then being transmitted through uh, portable solutions to be verified on the ground. And we will see in the subsequent presentations how typically the data that is being uh, made available uh, through different technical solutions could be used within CEPAL, uh, both for collecting training data and or going to the ground to do validation prints. I would like to clarify that um, CEPAL is being used for different purposes, but it's important that we understand that we don't provide ready-made statistics or maps. Uh, CEPAL is a place where we generate data, where we generate information, uh, and we generate information that fits to your needs. So typically, we've developed CEPAL within a forestry uh, environment. Um, and this is, uh, this is an example of how experts in Congo uh, use CEPAL to monitor the deforestation and the forest degradation. But uh, we have plenty of different usages uh, 
that could be that could be could be developed. So I will, I will give you other examples of and faster examples, and we should uh, potentially think about how we could use Zebal for the for the bamboo case. Um, so Cepal is completely free, it's completely open, and it has very different levels of, of accessing. Um, we have two main entry points. The first one is through the Google Earth Engine API, um, and you can call that API through a very user-friendly interface. Like I said, you absolutely don't need to be a, be a developer to do that. And with this, you can generate very easy mosaics of imagery. You can perform different types of classification and uh, land cover change detection. We call those recipes, and um, those recipes are predefined by the core team of developers, and they are the most straightforward way to generate sound and robust data. Uh, typically, here on screen, you can see how uh, Sentinel-1 radar time scans over the year can be used to map crop types within the agricultural census in Tunisia. And the only thing that is needed here as an input is some training data. Um, and we use training data for agricultural crops, but we could totally uh, imagine different types of training data coming. The second uh, point of entry into CEPAL is through our Python and R modules uh, on the cloud. Um, and we have uh, 30 modules available. And this is exactly where uh, we have the most collaboration with, uh, with different institutions and research centers, um, because this is where um, um, experts across the world can use the can use the platform to diffuse and to make accessible uh, to the public their public chains, their processing algorithms, and so on. Um, here, this is a type of module where we have uh, different institutions, including from um, from um, from WRI, from uh, the Zurich Institute, to generate geospatial layers that can be combined to produce restoration opportunities, maps, and statistics. And uh, this is again very user-friendly, and it can then allow you to create very quickly geospatial data um, um, fitting your needs. So typically, uh, what we could do within the CEPAL platform to help uh, fill the gap that Marco um, previously mentioned uh, with, uh, with Bamboo data is through um, using cloud computing um, solutions to, to perform classification, for example. And the only thing you really need to do uh, to do to generate this kind of information is to bring in the training data. So if we have bases of uh, where we know uh, bamboo is standing, for instance, where we have uh, geolocated plots, so we have geolocated uh, polygons that have been uh, previously defined, we can use the platform to generate radar and optical images for the uh, for the areas of interest and the periods of interest and perform either pixel-based or object-based profile classification. And uh, here again, I'm taking back the example of the, of the Bangladesh um, mosaic that, that have been shown in the, in the first slide, and how these mosaics can be transformed into uh, land cover thematic uh, information through the use of ground training data from the forest inventory. Right, um, this is going to be my last slide. Um, I would just like to show you uh, again an example of how we can use uh, research and um, and existing uh, um, existing papers in in the literature to quickly um, use that and adapt them to to test them within the CEPAL platform. And this is a this is an example of a land surface phenology matrix that will take into account all the um, vegetation index of uh, of within the year. Uh, information that can be combined into a day of the year uh, to separate different types of phenology crops. And uh, this is typically a, a good uh, a good practice to do efficient crop type separation. Um, and we're using this in uh, in West Africa, for instance, to, to map agricultural type. I will stop on the, oh no, yeah, just last one. We have lots of documentations and tutorials. My take or message would be that Cepal is free, it's public, anyone can use it, and it has a very large support community. Um, check it out. Uh, feel free to go and uh, and uh, register and uh, and check the documentations and and tutorials and uh, um, and reach out to us if you need uh, if you need any uh, help or if further interested in using Cepal to to fill in the gaps that are existing with a 
with Bamboo information. So yeah, the platform is an uh, HTTPS uh, that's separate IO and uh, do register and uh, you can reach out to us uh, any moment. I'm very curious to see how the next presentations will discuss the information that is out there and how it could be, it could be used within the platform. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Rami. Uh, you have uh, clearly present that this software is indeed very simple, user-friendly, that also uh, be useful both for biophysical, socioeconomic, and the fact that it doesn't require high-tech uh, computer skills uh, makes it even more uh, usable or widely usable. I think uh, this can be further promoted over the years to come. Uh, thank you again for your uh, awesome presentation. Now, uh, uh, the next uh, panelist is Professor Shu Chin. She is uh, a professor at International Center for Bamboo and Rattan Research. Her specialization is forest inventory, and her specialization is more on bamboo ecosystem service and bamboo ecosystem assessment. She has uh, uh, then, or she has predicted the size and the the acreage of bamboo resources in several regions of China. She has also several publications out of this. So uh, she would like to share us uh, some aspect of her experience in this uh, short time. So uh, Professor, the floor is yours. Thank you. 10 minutes. Thank you, Tafira. Um, good afternoon. My name is Qing, and I work with the International Center for Bamboo and Rattan. Today, I feel very pleased and honored to present what we have found in utilizing remote sensing to assess uh, bamboo resources in China. On behalf of my colleagues and collaborators, the title of my talk today is Harnessing Remote Sensing and Model-Based Inference for Predicting Bamboo Forest Area in Fujian Province, China. For understanding the big picture for bamboo resources, first we want to know the total area of bamboo forests and where exactly these bamboo forests locate. Except for the baseline information, we are also interested in the change in geographical range of bamboo forests across time because time trend of bamboo forest area is one of our long-term research aims. Uh, to answer these questions, uh, the design-based uh, inference, which is widely adopted by national forest inventory of countries like China and the United States, uh, it's not capable of figuring out the spatial location for bamboo forests, uh, nor efficient in generating area estimates for every year. In contrary, the model-based inference assisted with remote sensing data proves to have a larger potential for predicting where and how much for bamboo resources. Besides, it's very important to determine the baseline and the time trend for the area of bamboo forests in China because it facilitates the understanding of roles of bamboo forests in achieving carbon neutrality targets among China's social economic sectors. 
let's have a look at what kind of materials we have for the study area. For remote sensing data, uh, we acquired Landsat 8 satellite images for the, in, uh, for the whole year of 2018. And this figure shows that eight scenes of Landsat images are able to cover the entire territory of Fujian province. For the field truth data, we have uh, more than 4,000 China's NFI sample plots for model calibration or model training. And these plots were physically visited in 2018 as well. For model validation or testing, we have a Landsat survey data, uh, which consisted of more than another 4,000 uh, plots observed in the year of 2019. I have a slide for the spatial distribution of uh, China's NFI data for Fujian province and the land cover data. Uh, it's clearly show that China's NFI data, it's under a systematic design uh, with green dots representing uh, bamboo plots and a dark red uh, dots representing non-bamboo plots. But the land cover data, uh, it's more prone to a subjective selection. Uh, to generate remote sensing variables, we uh, extracted six raw bands, um, which are spectral reflectance and three principal components, uh, seven heraldic textural features, seven vegetation indices, and three tassel cap transformation components. Um, we also used a couple of methods for variable selection um, to reduce the dimension of remote sensing variables. For the model, we essentially utilize the binary logistic regression to model the probability of bamboo forest because the observed determining uh, de uh, dependent variable is the presence and absence of bamboo forest. Such kind of variable follow Bernoulli distribution with the mean of the distribution denoted by P and the variance of the distribution denoted by P multiplied one minus P. So for, a, for the ice pixel, the probability for bamboo forest showing up, it's a function of remote sensing variables um, with the mathematical formula uh, expressed on the slide. With X uh, denoting remote sensing variables and beta it's a vector of parameters to be estimated. After we utilize the maximum likelihood to estimate beta, we have pixel level predictions, but we are not only interested in pixel level predictions. We also concern the uncertainty or variance of the pixel level prediction. We then utilize Taylor theory expansion to understand the variance or covariance of the pixel level prediction. To understand the mean probability of bamboo forests for our entire study area, it is actually a mathematical mean of the pixel level predictions. And the variance of the mean P, it's a summation of variance and covariance of the pixel level predictions. And to estimate for our bamboo forest area, for the study area, uh, it is a product of the estimated mean P and the total area of Fujian province in China. Uh, here are the results. Actually, we obtain quite promising results, and this pro uh, and this results are sort of uh, inspiring. Um, we found that um, moisture-related uh, remote sensing variables uh, uh, played an important role in distinguishing bamboo from non-bamboo. We compared models that uh, used uh, remote sensing variables of a single season, um, 
for uh, for their performance in classifying those two categories. And we constructed confusion matrix. And we found that uh, either summer model or fall model has better accuracy than the other seasons with the accuracy from 72% uh, to uh, 83%. Um, and with a COPPA uh, from 0 0.62 to 0 0.68. Actually, the confusion matrix uh, were uh, constructed for both training data and the testing data. And assessed by the McFadden pseudo R square, um, the result comply with what we found with the confusion matrix as well. Here we show uh, the, uh, the pixel level predictions uh, using the wall to wall uh, prediction maps. Among 86, 80, 80, uh, uh, among uh, 68 counties in Fujian province, uh, we selected two counties that are known for their rich bamboo resources. One is called Jiangou County, and the other is called Sanming. For the final result, uh, for the paper, uh, for the main probability of bamboo forests for Fujian province, uh, the model-based estimation have got a uh, mean probability for 10.7%, uh, which means that 10.7% uh, of the total area of Fujian province is covered by bamboo forest. And we found that compared with the design-based estimation, uh, the model-based estimation has a much smaller standard deviation or variance or uncertainty uh, compared with the design-based uh, standard deviation. Therefore, we are able to draw two conclusions. The first one, uh, the model-based estimate for bamboo forest area using China's NFI sample plot is statistically unbiased. And the second, compared with the design-based estimate, uh, the model-based estimate is more precise due to a much smaller prediction variance. Uh, that's all for my talk today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor, for uh, your eloquent uh, presentation. Uh, uh, from uh, the long presentation, we can uh, uh, deduce that the, the method she is using, that the, uh, it is uh, generally uh, statistically unbiased. The result they found is uh, better. And also uh, compared to the design-based estimate, they found that this uh, the uh, model based on is relatively uh, better. Uh, with this, uh, I would like to move to uh, the next presenter. The next presenter is Vet uh, An Hang. He is uh, also a, a, an expert in remote sensing and GIS. He has a lot of experience in uh, assessing resources, bamboo resource, forest resource in different parts of the world. He has also uh, with colleagues developed the uh, mobile app-based bamboo resource inventory method and IT-based server system for Imbar. So uh, Vet An, uh, uh, please uh, take the floor for the next 10 minutes. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Tefera. Uh, so uh, good morning and uh, good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's my uh, pleasure to uh, present at uh, this event. And uh, very glad uh, to see uh, many uh, uh, friendly face. So the title of my talk, it's... Uh, the use of a mobile application for bamboo uh, resource assessment. So uh, in the previous talk, we uh, have uh, seen the uh, um, uh, methods to, to map uh, uh, bamboo 
uh, from space using uh, CEPAL and then uh, uh, using uh, advanced uh, mapping technique with uh, uh, with uh, uh, Landsat uh, data in China. So uh, um, uh, in uh, in this uh, um, application, we we go uh, down to, to the field level and, and measure the data at, at, uh, at the farm level. Um, so uh, my name is uh, Hoàng Việt Anh from uh, GFD uh, Consulting. So in uh, 2019, uh, I have uh, a pleasure to work with uh, INBA from uh, uh, East Africa uh, project. Uh, first uh, initiated by uh, by Siam Padel, and then the project is led by uh, Mr. Zaraman Burai. Uh, the purpose is to build an uh, application for bamboo mapping. So the Inba mobile uh, survey is a platform uh, that enabling fin data collection, uh, storage, and uh, analysis of uh, bamboo resources for Inba member country. So in short, it's it's a, a tool for inventory, for bamboo inventory uh, at, at the ground level. So uh, why we use the uh, mobile app for bamboo uh, assessment in the field? So in traditional method, the data collection is it's time consuming. Uh, the surveyor, we need to go to the field and bring uh, lots of things like a paper map, surveying form, a camera, a GPS. And then after taking the measurement in the film, the process of data entry into the computer, it's kind of time consuming and prone to errors. A mobile application will simplify this process and allow data to send and store directly in a centralized database. And then the data is ready to use and to share to the intended user. Uh, so in uh, our development process, the first, uh, the first system is uh, developed and then operated in, uh, in uh, for uh, East Africa country. Uh, and then uh, we develop a new system for own uh, INBA member country in uh, 2020. Uh, in this uh, application, we collect uh, uh, location of the bamboo uh, boundary of the bamboo uh, plantation on the field. Uh, information related to uh, bamboo uh, quantity and quality and the feed picture that is uh, on the basic uh, information needed for, for uh, uh, bamboo inventory. Uh, initially, the system was designed for three countries, Ethiopia, Uganda, and Kenya, and then uh, we also include uh, Madagascar. Uh, the system was designed so that uh, the country and sub-country level can uh, collect the data and send it to the server. In the meantime, the regional uh, office level can also do the data collection. Uh, at the country level, the manager can uh, aggregate the data uh, for the uh, M&E and reporting purposes. The system has uh, three main components. Uh, the mobile uh, client that is used in the field for data collection the central database and the back end for data storage and for providing web services. And uh, we have a web application for data uh, consumption and uh, visualization. User, user can also interact with the database through a desktop uh, application, such as uh, Quantum GIS. We also provide API and uh, web services for third party connection. For the parameter, the application, we collect the following information. Uh, administrative unit, it's down to level five. Uh, we collect site condition and ownership. We collect uh, bamboo uh, tree parameters, so that's uh, bamboo species, simply uh, culture measurement apply, uh, bamboo quality, so that's uh, tree high, the node length, the thickness, the clump diameter, the density, and so on. So uh, this is uh, some example screenshot of the uh, mobile app user interface. Uh, we work with the uh, INBA expert to incorporate the data validation into the data collection process to, to reduce uh, data errors. Uh, for software de development, we try to use uh, own uh, open source uh, software that is help to reduce the licensing cost and make it easy to skin up and transfer to uh, to INBA and, and uh, to other country. Uh, we make the mobile client work in offline mode. 
so it's suitable to operate in a remote area with uh, less or with no access to 3G connection. Uh, the app only needs uh, internet when it uh, sends data to the server. We also produce uh, two guidelines. The first is how to use the software, and second is uh, how to make the correct uh, measurement uh, in the field. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, actual data collection in the field we see uh, uh, do right here. Um, so uh, once the data is collected, it can instantly push to the server and then become available to own user through the web interface. Here we can see that uh, uh, we uh, collect the uh, geometry uh, of the bamboo uh, stand in the film information uh, related uh, to the bamboo quality you can see it uh, on the panel on the right here and also the film picture uh, here is an example from uh, the web interface that show the one page uh, information card uh, for for one data point so for one data point we have the map of, uh, of the farm we have all the information and we have uh, the, the the film picture it is a very uh, useful uh, um, uh, to to provide, for example, for for potential seller to to see and and to trace uh, the uh, the quality of the bamboo and also the the land uh, channel uh, situation and and the actual bamboo on the ground. Uh, so here is a short uh, summary of data collection in uh, East Africa uh, country. Uh, we have uh, more than uh, 9,000 data points uh, collected so far with the most active in uh, Ethiopia with more than 5,000 uh, data points. Uh, for the uh, global app, uh, we have uh, active data collection only in uh, Ecuador, some in Cameroon and in Indonesia, but not much in other country because we, we don't have a, a well plan uh, to uh, promote the app uh, in, in other country yet. I think for each country, uh, if you want to uh, scale up this uh, application, we need uh, 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 training and then uh, demonstration and, and some uh, maybe initial funding to, uh, uh, to, to start the program. Uh, for the global app, we uh, developed the user management uh, system so that uh, each country can manage their own user. So we can uh, just uh, need to assign and uh, manage the account for, for each country, and then they can uh, manage their own uh, system of user. So it uh, make it easy to uh, to transfer the system to, to other country. So here is an uh, example of the web interface. Where it allows people to download the full data as a GIS file in geosession format or as an Excel file. Uh, with that, user can uh, conduct uh, advanced uh, data analysis using their own tool, either in Excel or, or in uh, uh, statistical um, um, computing uh, software. But for more simple data analysis, they can use a pivot uh, function on the web interface. So here we have uh, two examples. The first is uh, to uh, find out the uh, uh, bamboo area in each country uh, that has the, the land uh, tenor. The second example is uh, to uh, look for uh, area of, of a specific uh, species, uh, bamboo species uh, in, in each uh, country. And uh, we, we can do uh, many of uh, uh, this uh, uh, similar um, like question to, to answer uh, like like simple um, a simple analysis uh, for for bamboo uh, status. So uh, some uh, takeaway messages: uh, the uh, Inba bamboo mapping app was developed and uh, operated uh, for about four years, and it's uh, run quite smoothly. Uh, now the um, application is uh, hosted in uh, in a Inba server. Uh, but we can also, uh, before that, we hosted it uh, on, on a commercial server and uh, it's, uh, the cost is uh, quite low. So it's just a few, uh, a few hundred dollars a year. So, uh, so the, the system can be uh, uh, very low cost. Even uh, it serves a, a few thousand users uh, until now. 
uh, currently it uh, operated as a two separate system, uh, one for East Africa country and one for own Imba uh, member country. In the future, uh, we uh, may need uh, to do uh, data harmonization and, and it can be uh, challenging. Uh, we can see that the data collection in uh, East Africa is a lot more active uh, than other country. We have uh, 9,000 data points compared to uh, 1,200 data points in other country. So we can see that the, the system it, uh, is just a tool. Uh, the training, the uh, data collection, planning, uh, facilitation, and, and funding is uh, very important uh, to, to make it work and uh, to keep the system alive. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, new resources will be uh, need to invest uh, for the app maintenance, spin up, and and further develop. Uh, for example, we might need to uh, redesign. Uh, we might need to uh, uh, redesign the system uh, from now as the almost like an inventory base, uh, and change it to the uh, monitoring base data model. That means uh, recognizing the. Uh, changing event, uh, recognizing the, the history of a, of a bamboo plant a lot. And uh, it, it can be quite big work. Uh, and I think the uh, data, uh, the ground data, uh, very high uh, quality ground data here, uh, collected uh, by like uh, uh, INBA uh, member, in INBA staff, uh, can be uh, used together with remote sensing data. It can be used as uh, uh, high high reliable uh, uh, training data. So, like in um, in China, you have uh, very uh, dense and and high quality and FI data. But in uh, other country, you might have uh, don't have uh, this uh, much information. So, this uh, graph data uh, can be used uh, for as uh, as uh, high quality training data. So, I uh, will end my uh, presentation here. And uh, thank you very much for your, your attention. Uh, I put uh, uh, two uh, websites that uh, have the uh, application and, and the mobile app here. So you are uh, welcome to, uh, to explore uh, the software. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, Viet An. Uh, I hope I didn't. I didn't. Uh, uh, I, I, I hope I pronounce your name. Uh, at least closer to the uh, correct name. Uh, yeah, uh, your presentation was impressive. Uh, we are now applying this up in uh, several uh, countries, as he rightly said it. And uh, uh, the peculiar feature of this uh, app is that it goes down to the uh, farmer village. You can see the number of bamboo poles a certain farmer have if, if they use this, this app-based inventory uh, uh, that the number of bamboo poles of a certain farmer can be easily counted, the area of his farm can be known, and the overall aggregate size of the bamboo, the area of volume is, is also calculated. And there is a very simple server they uh, produced for the uh, countries. The countries can aggregate all those uh, country level data in their system. They can use it uh, as appropriate. So the future will be to expand uh, these uh, pilot uh, uh, surveys into different bamboo uh, growing countries of the world. So thank you so much, Mr. Uh, uh, Viet An for that uh, contribution. Uh, next, uh, uh, I would like to move to uh, uh, our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. Sham uh, Powdell. He is uh, uh, also a very experienced forester. He is uh, a forest uh, ecosystem specialist by profession, but he has extensively worked uh, throughout the globe from Asia, mid Africa, America. I think he has uh, done a lot of uh, uh, job, bamboo related, forest related, or socioeconomic aspect. Of course, I also know him when he was working for Ethiopia 
in uh, an international organization. He, he has also experience specifically on bamboo. He has worked for IMBAR and for other UN organizations. Uh, his expertise on bamboo ecosystem and bamboo ecology is also impressive. Today, uh, he will present us uh, uh, the major issues of bamboo uh, ecosystem evaluation. He will start with uh, different uh, ecosystem services. Bamboo will provide and then may provide us some issues of the evaluation method. Uh, so the next 10 minutes will be yours. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shah. Unmute, unmute. Thank you, Tafera, for a nice introduction. Uh, good morning, uh, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are. I am really overwhelmed today to see, to meet lots of old friends here, you know. Like with Marco, we worked together almost like 15 years ago for that uh, on the bamboo inventory. With Vietnam, we were together in Vietnam. He was doing for, you know, bamboo inventory for us uh, using mobile apps. And then we were thinking about using mobile, mobile apps. Finally, we were, you know, happy to brought him to Ethiopia. Actually, there was no mobile app uh, application in the project itself. So actually, I, we had thought about this and we re redesigned everything. Now, seeing his presentation, I'm really happy. Thank you, Vietan. It was a great one. And with Tafera, we worked together when I was in Ethiopia, uh, working for forestry sector. So, you know, it's so nice to see everyone. And I, I work with uh, INBAR almost nine years from 2002 to 2011. So I was doing many things there, but one of the things I was doing also bamboo inventory, other things I established the bamboo housing pro program there, which is still running. So yes, uh, bamboo has been uh, not only passions, you know, it has become like a part of the life now, you know, wherever I go, wherever I work, I like to integrate, I like to make bamboo as a part of my work. Today, I just like to summarize, you know, a little bit uh, focusing on ecosystem services, but on climate side, you know, climate potential uh, in terms of mitigations and in terms of adaptations. I don't have to, let me, I'm not able to present it or what? It's, it's in the presentation mode? Okay. Okay. Yeah, I don't have to mention this. Everybody knows how great is the bamboo. To find a Wi-Fi network in your view also. Uh, okay. Okay. It's okay now? Yeah. So I like to focus more on ecosystem services. Of course, you know, there are few studies, very, very limited studies on bamboo ecosystem services. And uh, there was a study done by uh, my colleagues uh, from C4, uh, Dr. Himral Varal, Kiran Powdell. I was a reviewer for that. And we did some case study from Nepal, uh, also Ethiopia. I collected data in Al-Bali. And of course, we found that uh, Bamboo provides uh, all the ecosystem services uh, from provisioning services like food, forest, timber, regulating services, uh, the climate benefits, uh, soil and water conservation, uh, landslide control, it also provides great habitat for the uh, wild animals like pandas, like uh, mountain gorillas. You know, it has a good uh, biodiversity values. Uh, it has also cultural values. You know, in Nepal, we always use bamboo when you, 
you know, when you are born from cradle to grave, you know, and just, you know, looking at it from different perspective, uh, if you see the mitigation potential, you know, there are so many studies. Uh, based on those studies, you can find bamboo can store between 94 to 392. It's a range uh, per hectare, but it depends on what kind of species, what kind of management you are doing, whether it is a mixed species or it's a pure species. So there are many factors. Uh, just to go a little bit in details, you know, but I like to see a little bit differently for a bamboo. You know, bamboo you can harvest in five years and every, even if it is only one, one, 100, 100 ton per hectare, if it is a five year rotation, you can actually harvest 20 ton per year in the, you know, selection harvesting. And in 30 years of the, you know, carbon cycles and then the carbon projects, it's just multiply 20 by 30, it's a 600, simple, simple, 600 ton carbon, or it could be 1,200 uh, ton biomass. But, you know, depending on a species, it could be more. But achieving this potential, you know, of carbon sequestration and carbon harvesting, and also to go to the carbon market, the important thing is management, management, which is lacking. If you manage the bamboo correctly, and if you harvest sustainably and use sustainability for long-term use, like for housing, for some chair, for biochar, they can, you are restoring this carbon, you harvest every year, at least 20 ton or 40 ton biomass. So this is what not in, I don't see uh, this carbon methodology, even in the bamboo carbon methodology. So this is what I'm promoting these days, you know. Bamboo is different than other trees because you can harvest in five, fifth year. If you do the selection harvesting, Every year you can harvest 20%, which is at least 40 ton of biomass. So this is the mitigation potential. I don't want to go detail. I always promote to the you know private investor. I'm also in, you know promoting this in Thailand. Now I'm meeting some private investors. So this potential we need to tap, we need to explain, we need to raise the awareness. Of course, in terms of adaptations, we all know, you know, bamboo has so many applications, food, forage, and biochar, charcoal, energies. There are hundreds of uses, you know, that builds the resiliency of the communities, that can build the resiliency of the systems, natural ecosystems. I recently supported a project in Nepal, you know, I just do voluntarily. Uh, there is a uh, NGO namely Rupantaran is like a transformation it's run by my friend I they never knew the bamboo and I asked them why not you use bamboo especially for the restorations and rehabilitation of the degraded land they use I gave them some training also in the landslide area in the western Nepal uh, and they use the live bamboo like this you know in the in the massive areas and this is the degraded land uh, it's already, you know, lots of landslides happening there during the rainy seasons. And we use the live bamboo like this. This is live bamboo. And there are many ways. You know, we, we just wanted to stabilize how to make it like a bioengineering so that it protects the soil initial year. In the you know, subsequent year, you can grow bamboo and it becomes like a bamboo forest. Now it's last two years now they are doing. This is one of the techniques they are doing. You see now bamboo are growing in that bioengineering areas. There is already a forest. So you can see the potential of bamboo. It's a real, real example. I know this is what I'm actually promoting now in Laos also. You can use bamboo to restore the degrade, already degraded line like this. And it becomes the forest in the future. It will not only prevent the landslide, but it will also provide provisional services, food, other you know, timber, other things to the you know, local peoples. So now this is like this after one and a half year, two years. It's almost like a forest, bamboo forest. Yeah, in in Laos also, I'm I'm trying to promote bamboo to stabilize the river banks and wetlands. Uh, Laos has lots of bamboos, uh, although it's not my bamboo project. This is actually uh, ecosystem based adaptation projects, but you can easily integrate bamboo for soil conservation, for restoration, and for riverbank stabilization. And this is one of the examples, simple example, you know, There's lots of bamboo we want to plant in the buffer zone of the river and wetlands. This is one example from India, you know, they are using bamboo for agroforestry that also build the resilience of the communities. You can have a multiple, you know, uh, productions. Uh, they did some research from CGIR, you know, uh, with the chickpea and sesame. And they compared the productions and they found that, you know, the production of chickpea and sesame was almost same with and without 
agroforestry. But with agroforestry, now they can have other, you know, benefits, other, you know, like from bamboo. So they can have a benefit from bamboo. They can have benefit from chickpea and sesame. So you have a multiple benefits. So bamboo has a great potential for agroforestry. This is what we are not tapping also, you know. But you need to have a techniques, you know, how you want to plant, uh, which spacing, which species. We need to be very careful when you do this. And there is a study done by that study I just mentioned about. They compare bamboo with the natural forest, degraded forest, planted forest, uh, grassland, and agriculture. Uh, this was done basically uh, secondary data and uh, perception survey and household survey. How they read bamboo compared to other, you know, high, low, medium. And if you see in terms of sequestration carbon, we have data already. We don't have to, you know, but even the people think, you know, uh, the carbon mitigation potential is quite high in planted and degraded forest, but they think that uh, in terms of natural forest, uh, probably natural forest has higher than bamboo. But if you go to the more an adaptation site, you know, like flood control, groundwater research, water purifications, and other things, you know, you see they rated bamboo quite high and uh, they rated uh, other forests low. Mostly bamboo is higher and compared to agriculture and grassland, bamboo is always higher. So this is the you know published publication. It was done together with uh, INBAR. And I was the reviewer and data collection for this. I contributed for this one and I also cited them. This is a Mr. Powell and et al. Uh, it was done in 2020-21. The key message here is, you know, bamboo can provide you know, great ecosystem services, uh, both provisional and regulatory. The important thing here is the management. The knowledge on management is lacking, you know, sustainable management. If you can manage, you know, pro appropriately, properly, you can enhance the services significantly, both mitigation and adaptations. And uh, we need to have a greater awareness among policymakers, even among community level, you know, how to plant, how to manage, and how to enhance the ecosystem services. Some policy instruments may play an important role to encourage landowners to grow the bamboo. If they see there is a great mitigation potential, great you know, carbon sequestration potential, carbon market, market potential, plus with the 20% harvesting, they can have lots of provisional services. Uh, that's what the very short presentation I wanted to do. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Sham. Uh, it was uh, uh, a nice presentation. Uh, you have shown us a very good examples of regulatory services, especially with respect to land, soil, and water conservation. Those are really that can be uh, scalable to, to different uh, regions and countries. And uh, the other issue you mentioned that management is uh, indeed important. Yeah, B bamboo is all about management and technology. Otherwise, if you compare countries with the best uh, or the largest size of bamboo, may not have uh, equal or better benefit as those, for example, uh, like China. Of course, China has more bamboo resource, but the most important issue is the management and the technology. So that is interesting, uh, Aida. Um, of course, uh, uh, bamboo definitely has a lot of uh, ecosystem services, which could be comparable to natural forest. And uh, uh, these are important uh, points from uh, your presentation. Uh, all right. So uh, I think the uh, uh, the next presenter is Mr. Kamish Salem. Uh, it seems that I'm going from the relatively younger to the more veteran uh, bamboo specialists. Uh, Mr. Kamish was uh, the chair of uh, World Bamboo Organization. He is uh, also the CEO, the CEO of Ken and Bamboo Value Chain Development. That means he become a businessman. I, I hope so, it seems. And uh, he is also the executive director of South Asia Bamboo Foundation. He has extensive experience on bamboo in different parts of the world, based in India. 
So he will uh, share us uh, particularly important uh, purpose of bamboo on mining, reclamation, and restoration. And uh, uh, I would like to uh, uh, invite him to make his presentation. Thank you, Mr. Kamish. Thank you, Dafaria. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone who's listening to me today. Good day. I'm thankful to INBAR and FAO for giving me a chance to speak in this forum. In fact, this is my second opportunity to speak in BARC. I was there physically in the last BARC conference in Beijing. Unfortunately, due to COVID, we are online today. Also like to share my condolence to my friend T.P. Swarmoni, who was the regional director of INBAR, who was the victim of COVID. I hope we all are returning back to normal lives. Maybe the next bar conference we should be meeting physically. Also, I'm thankful to Mark uh, Marco Piazza, with whom I had a long relation working with him during my Unido days. Right now, based in Bangkok, Bangkok with FAO, been working very closely with him. My experiences more are mostly on the you you are um, unmuted. unmute. You have accidentally muted yourself. Yeah. Uthan is a project in Allahabad in India, which was initiated by the then uh, Dr. D. N. Tiwari, who was very much part of INBAR in India. Also, I've been associated with INBAR for the last 25 years when INBAR started in New Delhi. So these are a few of the land provides a principal basis for human livelihood and well-being, including the supply of food, fresh water, and other things. So these are, and again, it's difficult to move, yeah. Now, this is again uh, a typical uh, study done by Uthan and Inbar, where the in a brick field where the top soils are being removed and, and, and there is no productivity in the agriculture, the male members migrate to the cities, women, children, are elderly people remain extremely poverty, around 5,000 hectares of land lying unproductive. So, like after post COVID, the India needs uh, GDP growth, and several uh, uh, decisions are taken to recover the mining area. Like uh, these are some the government of India mandated regrassing of mining lands for current future recumulation, and bamboo is seen as the fastest growing grass as such. The mining degradation, the geological uh, rivers, the maximum degradation of forest areas, increase in mine over the burden of dams. Decreased contamination water bodies. The studies also reveal local people unable to cope with destruction of land, which provide them livelihood. So these are the destruction from the mining area. And also in climate change, mining sector responsible to four to seven percent of greenhouse emissions. So these are some of the bad part why, where the climate change is taking place because of huge mining that is taking place across the globe. And we all know this. So we feel that that bamboo led intensive production system will address the land degradation with a framework that builds reliance of mine workers to anthropogenic changes. So the reclamation of mines, like the government of India has a huge plan to carry out uh, grassing on mine area and bamboo, the fastest growing has led to the re sort ecosystem, especially when we talk of the brick field, brick mining areas over 20 years, local construction of rural stability in mining Landforms need to be driven by some of the ecological values, and since mining is driven by, so bamboo provides those values. So these are some of the pictures, how it looks like. These are not from India, from different countries, which I have collected. So before, after what we see. So these are some of the things that took place in, in, in Latin America in October, in April next year, the number, the greening take place, what Sam has just shown here, it has been done in other parts of the world. The decrement of mine area with bamboo, it raised the water level from 30 meters below surface to 25 meters in 2017. Increased ability of water in quality and quantity. Then bamboo leaf turned my, uh, microns to soil, borons and zinc. The decrement of land with bamboo, these are some of the figures that has been found from the Uthan Inba studies. Even male members, they return to the villages because of bamboo farming and then birds, animals, and mammals, even are recorded after that. The requirements of landmines with bamboo, this was replicated in 2,200 cities and rehabilitated around 86,000 hectares of degraded lands. Green people, uh, urban areas in 200 cities, 
reduce in cyclone storms and also help millions of folks to get rid of poverty and hunger. So these are some of the endorsement by the imminent policy makers across the globe. From Ethiopia, you see from, from the Democratic Republic of Congo, then you see from the Philippines, from the even our government, the Indian government, Modi government is planning to promote domestic bamboo industry is going to play a critical role in shaping the post-COVID economy in India. So some of the immediate report that in Singshui province, like uh, how in Nepal, bamboo plantations have solely recent, as mentioned by my friend Sam, bamboo is also used in successfully restored legal mines in Ghana, many in the West Coast where the gold mining areas, bamboo poles are being used in tsunami heat in Southern, in, in Thailand. Also in my own state in Assam, we use bamboo for the flood relief and all kind of soil embankment. So climate change adaptation and mitigation that is required. So bamboo is a climate change mitigation and adaptation tool. We all know that very well. Then, and, and also regrassing restore around the mining platforms, bamboo captures and store carbon, which is mentioned earlier by my speakers. So bamboo is ecosystem providing tools. Now the issue of funding issue. We always discuss about where the fund can come from. There are a lot of, 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 of funds available from CSR fund, from Kampa is a government of India program, which also share the compulsory forest management. Uh, it's around $6 billion are available, and even JEF funding are available. So pandemic involved consumers shift to ethical med products to consumer driven economic growth. So impact investment increase in climate smart projects. And also you see that there are other impacts that uh, uh, also climate change impact investing born in 2007 to assess capital. Sustainable investment return to competing with traditional investment today, evidence of so proof of bamboo so, uh, of social ecology change are uh, very imminent. Again, investment by, by even single family, the, the Melinda family, all the other people, lots of funds are available for this kind of job uh, in re restoration with bamboo. And also bamboo has created profitable ecosystem. We talk about Anji uh, and bamboo has around $60 billion market, including bamboo charcoal. Demand for bamboo is increasing day by day, including incense taken in India. So all bamboo product system has potential for social economic gains with net returns. So key findings and result, bamboo technology assisted plantations can reclaim degraded mining lands. Bamboo provides social ecology to the poor and contribute to the uh, poverty elevations in mining area. Bamboo creates well of economy, uh, rural economies. Bamboo is a climate smart mitigation and adoption tool for restoring mining landscape. So bamboo can attract impact investment. Bamboo can also assess fund for climate smart production system from resource generations to industrial production. CSR fund accessible for land degradation, neutrality, land remediation. Bamboo can drive social ecological benefits and reduce generations. Also fund available for building climate adaptive capacities of people in degraded landscape. Proof of concept exists in eight countries. Integrating funds may create climate change that the fund used for socio-ecological change in mining, but who will take the first step? This is something I would like INBAR and FEO to take the lead on this issue of mining degraded land where bamboo can create neutral bamboo. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Kamish, for uh, uh, showing uh, another aspect of the application of bamboo, especially in these highly degraded mining areas are highly degraded in many terms, in nutrient, in, in even in uh, soil seed bank, it, it lacks many of those. So uh, restoring this area takes uh, a lot of effort and very resistant species is needed. So if bamboo is proven to have a good potential, then it is uh, it is something Imbar can take it up and work with member countries uh, to uh, uh, apply it on that uh, aspect. So you show us uh, very uh, important uh, aspects of uh, another aspect of bamboo. Thank you so much uh, for uh, your presentation. Uh, I think uh, now we have more or less finished uh, our uh, panelist presentation. The next uh, few minutes will be for question and answer. Uh, if there are any question, I think uh, 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 Marco, is there any question in the inbox? Uh, can you see? Yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Tefera. Uh, no, I don't see questions in the Q&A 
um, box. So I encourage anyone who would like to ask a question, this is the time to do it. Uh, I think you can type directly in, um, in the chat and then we can uh, actually in the Q&A box and then uh, we can uh, reply either in writing or, uh, or uh, with our contribution. I actually have a question if I'm allowed uh, to maybe kick off and see if anybody else has a question. But uh, I think we have seen <clears throat> a bit of a journey in this, uh, in this session. Uh, starting from a wider scale down to a, a, a finer scale. We started with uh, remote sensing, started with uh, uh, assessment of Mambu from, uh, uh, from space, and then down to the last presentation from uh, um, Kamesh Salam on, uh, on a very practical application and how even uh, jobs were regained thanks to the application of Mambu. Anyway, I, I, I like to ad, um, acknowledge this sort of journey that we, that we did. Uh, so with the, the scope of trying to put um, some of the pieces together, uh, particularly for the first part. I have a question for my, my colleague, uh, Remy, if, uh, if he's available still. Um, basically, um, in, the area of in the area of assessment, okay, so we saw a, a presentation from Dr. Ching on uh, uh, modeling, and uh, she explained her approach with probability maps as well. And then on the other part, we saw the presentation from Viet Han, on the mobile uh, application and uh, and the value of that. So we have the two elements, right? The, the, the remote sensing part and the field part. Uh, how does that, how would that play around, play within a CPOL framework? Uh, uh, this is a question for, uh, for uh, Remy D'Annunzio. Uh, you mentioned before that, uh, yeah, in CEPAL, this is where we generate data, right? So if we have the right elements, we can create our own data. Um, how do you see these two elements play in the, within the CEPAL platform? platform. Thank you, Marco. Actually, when I was when I was yeah. listening to the presentation from from Professor Jing and then from uh, Viet, uh, I was I was really thinking the same uh, the same. Um... Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I was I was having the same train of thoughts. Uh, I think it was hugely interesting to see uh, how much work is already being developed to to map bamboo and what kind of information is available. And typically, um, the the data that is being needed in the model that Professor Ching uh, presented, the different metrics, the the texture uh, variables, the vegetation index, the probability mapping, and the different types of models, all this could potentially be tested inside the separate platform. We have we have the tools and we have the 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 infrastructure to do that. Uh, it would actually be extremely interesting to see if we could use. Um, some of the training data that they've used, but also complements with the data that is being collected in different parts of the world with the mobile app that Viet An presented. And uh, I would be extremely uh, eager to see how uh, the different types of training data that could be used in the different countries could be, could be used and how we could scale up the model, uh, maybe. So I think there is a very good case here to make um, to show that... Uh, we actually are almost mature to do this at, at a large scale in a harmonized way. And I think it would be a very interesting, um, very interesting exercise to bring together those, those pieces of information and, uh, and try to run them and make them accessible for a wider public so that everybody can do uh, the mapping and generate information like this so that we make it more available in general. So I'd, I'd be very happy to push forward that conversation and to see how we could work together on this. Thank you, Remy. Um, I think you touched upon also a, a key point. I know Sepal a little bit or enough to, to make a comment, I think. And uh, I think when we talk about bamboo assessment, uh, we have talked about the global bamboo assessment, but I think the real value is not just a few experts or a few scientists putting together and try to do a, a, a global assessment, but I think the real value is that each country is capacitated to do their own statistics, uh, and then they can be uh, aggregated. But I think, and I think CEPAL has the right 
uh, user friendliness uh, that with some capacity building that I know it's been years that you guys are doing uh, all over the world. Uh, so that each country can have uh, the ability to collect their own data and then there will be a system to aggregate all of this. But uh, uh, I think it's more of a, a bottom up approach rather than uh, if you have scientists getting together uh, to, to create uh, global maps. This is my, my idea. Totally agree. I think I saw one hand raised. Yes, Kamesh. Yeah, this is for Remy. You are showing a lot of work being done in Bangladesh and bamboo. Are there anything available from for Bangladesh? Uh, yes, uh, we should we should we should double check that. But uh, I know it's one of the layers that they had done in the land cover, and they had done the land cover twenty fifteen. Um, if you if we go to the to the um, BFI, I think it's Bangladesh Forest Inventory uh, website. You will find uh, some of the land cover products, and uh, one of that is uh, would be the class. Remember, we could extract that totally to to okay. generate uh, prior information, and that okay. could be used to re-update for more recent periods. So yes, totally, very good, uh, very good point. This is typically one of the places where CEPAL has been used to map land cover and where that could be reused. Yeah, good point. Thank you, Remy. Why I'm asking is that uh, we have a big event coming up in Bangladesh next month in Dhaka. Okay, so I would like sir. if something available, I want to create a poster for the people to see. I would like to you separately. Let's let's uh, talk about that um, on a different channel. But yes, that that would be very interesting. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, Professor uh, has a question. I don't know for whom. Uh, please. Um, I have a question for Viet An. Did I pronounce your name correctly? But um, you have shown a slide with a list of different countries uh, from where you collected field data. And for China, I, I, I saw that there was only one point that you collected. And my question is that uh, what hindered you from collecting data from China? <laughs> uh yeah thank you thank you and before before you answer you you also mentioned issue of harmonization and wh why harmonization is needed why don't you have a universal method you can also answer that yeah thank you uh so for the data point in in china maybe we uh just do it in by during the, the testing uh testing phase uh, we have uh, one um, uh, coordinator, coordinator who uh, at, uh, in Bar Beijing headquarters at the moment. Maybe, so maybe he, he just try to to test the software. Uh, but in China, the uh, the mobile application is, is not being used uh, system systematically yet. Although the the method the uh, the, the system is there. But, uh, yeah, as I said, uh, in uh, in uh, East Africa country, it's. Uh, uh, due to the uh, uh, project setup, uh, the, the, the data collection is very intensive uh, compared to other countries. Uh, and uh, for the uh, um, for the harmonization, uh, so uh, also due to the uh, due to the project setup, uh, the uh, uh, it's uh, Africa country. Uh, you have some uh, like uh, uh, specific uh, parameter tailor for, for that reason. So now we have uh, one uh, one system for uh, East uh, Africa country and one that can be used for for any country uh, in in uh, whether it's in bar member or or it's a non non in bar member you can do that but the, the the parameter set is a little bit different. Thank you. Uh, uh, okay, I have a question uh, uh, for Mr. Kamish. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, if if we plan this um, uh, mining restoration activity, uh, one thing comes to my mind: the, the, this the ownership is distorted. The tenure system mining areas are often uh, taken legally or illegally from the uh, traditional owners and are maybe I don't know the owners who will be now. So uh, how do you think will be the future of restoration from ownership tenure perspective? 
that is why we talk about uh, CSR fund and also the under the uh, CSR fund and also government intervention is very much required because it's really basically the community who will be running the show. So government intervention is very much required like what is being done in India. The mines that are restored are being you know, uh, given to the community to run the plantation where the industry will have been support in giving planting material and you know water irrigation and whatever required. So it would be a public partnership model, PPP model. But we need to start somewhere, as I said. Thank you so but much. The government of India is very clear on how to recover or, or no, the, the degraded land. And bamboo could be the first challenge that what we see. And already Inbar and Uthan has done in, in, in Allahabad in UP. That was 20 years back. So the, the model is already available with us. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much. I think uh, we are uh, fast finishing uh, the time allocated for our uh, session. Um, I really thank every every presenters. It was like hectic uh, slide preparation, recording of your presentation. So many, so many things. You did all those despite your very, very tight time and a lot of other responsibilities. I really thank you for that. So uh, uh, I, I would like to uh, invite Marco to say a few words of concluding remarks. And uh, then Marco will close uh, the session. Thank yeah, you. Thank, thank you, Tefera. I will try to stay within the limits. Um, again, thanks also from my part to the, the, the panelists, uh, the participants, uh, those who have attended, and also to Imbar, who has allowed us to, to put together this uh, session. I listed a, a few um, key takeaways. Uh, each presentation had some takeaways, so those are the most important. Um, but my yeah, my key takeaways, I would say that uh, we have seen that there is a still a strong call for updated data on bamboo. Uh, this is still something that remains both at the global level and also for the countries, which and having data is the only way in which we can uh, um, really make sure that we <clears throat> utilize the, the infinite almost possibilities of, of bamboo. Uh, we have seen the technology exists, method exists, uh, remote sensing and field application. So these are the two entry points uh, that would allow, um, again, assessment of, of bamboo. So we, we can say that we are ready to, to do this work. Um, it is also important to recognize ecosystem services of bamboo. All of us here, they, we know bamboo very well. We know that the, the utilizations are, are uh, almost infinite uh, from the uh, economic sector, from the uh, ecosystem uh, sector. Uh, we mentioned the role of bamboo in, uh, in reaching carbon neutrality, which is uh, so much more uh, important uh, nowadays, uh, but also at the local level for livelihood development. Um, and then I think something that also was raised by more than one presenter is uh, the need for further resources uh, for uh, reaching out to the private sector, reaching out to donors to make sure that the, the work that we are now talking about that could actually be implemented and could be supported uh, within projects in support to government as well as to uh, facilitate and promote the use of, uh, of the tools that we, that we are talking about. Uh, um, I just make a, a common note, which I have made in a few other presentations similar to this that I, that I joined. Um, I often have the feeling that uh, the bamboo world uh, is so exciting for us, but oftentimes remains a little bit in a niche. Uh, it's a little bit hidden from, uh, from, let's say, the world of forestry at large. And uh, when I go, or when I see the, the, the plans for the World Forestry Congress or the, the COP uh, or other international uh, conferences, I always go and see, is there anybody talking about bamboo? And lately, in the last few years, I see a little bit more involvement. Uh, but I think that this is a very crucial tool. The IMBAR does this, uh, the yeah, FAO does this, or our organization who are working on bamboo to present their work at the global level and world level uh, conferences. I think this would uh, slowly but surely raise the, the attention on, on bamboo and would attract more attention uh, by practitioners and also by donors who can uh, make sure that uh, uh, some of these uh, excellent ideas and experience can, uh, can become projects and can become a real, uh, real activities in the field. Um, I think these are my last thoughts. Back to you, Tefera, for just the last goodbye, I think.
Yeah, I think uh, uh, I see uh, one question. So it wouldn't be good if we don't answer that question. It seems for Mr. Vet An, uh, it is uh, technical. Can you see it, uh, Mr. Vet An? Yeah. Uh, can you repeat? Can you read the question? Uh, the question says recently uh, uh, the update seems not working or something like that with the new latest phones like Samsung uh, A71 something. It doesn't work. Can you say something about this? If if it needs checking, further checking, then you don't need to answer. But if you have immediate answer, you can say something. Uh, where can I see the, ah, the QA? Sorry. Just go to Q&A and... Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. Sorry, okay. Ah, so uh, it, uh, it's uh, the main issue with, with the Android uh, system. It's, uh, it's very fragmented. So sometimes we have a new mobile phone that uh, mm -hmm. the, the app uh, doesn't support it very well. So in this case, we, we just need to... Uh, like apply some patch that uh, recognize some, like here it's have a, a specific model for, for Samsung uh, mobile phone. So we, we look into that. All right, thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Uh, Marco, have you finished your uh, uh, summary? Yes, yes, yes. All right, I then thank you. <laughs> I think we are perfectly on time. Thank you again, all of you. It was a very nice uh, discussion. Please keep on uh, in contact and let's develop the bamboo resource assessment techniques, methods, and technology. Thank you so much. Goodbye, everybody. Okay.